Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I'm Mary Ruth Leftwich, the Director of Learning from the Senator John Hines History Center. We're excited to have you this afternoon for a special program that allows us to delve deeper into the art and science of conservation as it relates to a piece that is featured in our current exhibition, Smithsonian's Portraits of Pittsburgh. So we have a great afternoon in store for you. Lots of amazing content, images, resources, and an opportunity for Q&A. So today you can reach us using two tools at the bottom of your screen. There is a Q&A box and there is also a chat box. So if you want to reach the panelist, you can use that chat box. And if you want to be able to share your comments with everyone in attendance today, make sure you pull down the drop down, the little blue drop down menu there to say panelists and attendees. And then that was something that everyone will be able to see. During the Q&A, it is helpful for us to be able to have those questions set aside. So you can use the Q&A box and that allows you to type in your question and we will do our best to answer it live during the Q&A portion. If you have any technical issues, feel free and send me a chat and I will do my best to help you. So I'm excited today to introduce our senior curator and the curator for our portraits exhibition, Leslie Sibilic, who is going to introduce the program a little bit more, tell you what's in store and introduce our speakers. Welcome, Leslie. Hey, thank you, Mary Ruth. And to all of you out there, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We have talked about this being a program that we wanted to try for quite a while. And just a few comments about the date, and then I will introduce our three esteemed speakers for this afternoon. We originally decided to do this program in coordination with the national social media campaign, hashtag Ask a Conservator Day, which usually is scheduled for November 4th. That date was picked to coordinate with the historical date of November 4th, 1966, when a cataclysmic thousand year flood descended upon the Renaissance Italian city of Florence and really threatened to destroy multiple generations worth of historic and artistic and archival treasures. But art conservators from across the world sort of descended upon Florence and really helped to save the treasures of that city. And so in honor of that and marking that as the date, every year, November 4th is typically hashtag ask a conservator day, except this year. Technically the date has been moved to November 18th because of the event that I'm sure we're all in the back of our heads kind of checking today and that's the presidential election. But there is another November 4th connection related to this story of the Ebenezer Denny miniature. And I'm not going to give that away until the very end of the program. So you have to wait until the end of the program and you'll hear another November 4th story. But I did want to acknowledge that this program is supposed to be tied into a national social media effort that really looks at a milestone in conservation history. And you know, some of you may have joined us for other programs related to the current portrait gallery exhibition. Smithsonian's Portraits of Pittsburgh work from the National Portrait Gallery. And one of the ongoing conversations we've had is this issue of missing voices. Who is depicted, who's not? What does it mean if someone is in a national collection? And we've looked at portraits of women in connection with the suffrage history. We've had a program on portrait cookie activism. And just a couple weeks ago, we looked at the work of a photographer who spent part of a lifetime documenting great American playwrights, people who normally don't appear in front of the curtain on stage. But there are other voices involved with these stories too, different kinds of people and different kinds of stories. And you know, an exhibition like this would not be possible if we didn't have the material, the artworks and the artifacts to put on the walls or to put in those cases. And by extension, if we didn't have the people who helped to take care of those materials. You know, collections care and conservation is crucial, painstaking and quiet work. It's done behind the scenes. If it's done well, you, the visitor, frankly, in many respects, don't see it. What you see is the glory, the beauty of that object, or in some cases, the stability of a piece. But what you see is the object shining through. What is more difficult to see is all the work that went on behind the scenes to make sure that that is what you see. 
And so today we're gonna change that just a little bit. We have a program that gives you a chance to hear behind the scenes from three people who've been involved with the conservation and treatment of a small jewel of an object that is one of our History Center pieces that's featured in the exhibition. And you will hear from two conservators today and then a member of our own staff. And what I'm gonna do is give you a little bit of intro of all three of those people now, and then you'll see their names as they appear on screen. The two conservators who are both connected with a collaboration in Pittsburgh called, called Art Conservation Etc. or ACE Conservators, and you'll hear more about that through the course of the program, are Rhonda Wozniak, Senior Objects Conservator, who you will see first in the video this afternoon when we get to the conservation part. Rhonda is the owner and the Chief Conservator of Rhonda Wozniak Objects Conservation, LLC, which she founded in 2006. And she specializes in the treatment of a wide variety of materials, including outdoor sculpture, decorative arts, and archeological materials. And she previously was the object conservator for 10 years at the Carnegie Museum of Art. She has a background in metals conservation with a focus in corrosion studies. And actually this sounds fascinating, of marine archeological objects and previously had done work at the Western Australian Maritime Museum. And she holds an MA and a Certificate of Advanced Studies in Conservation from the State University of New York, Buffalo State College. And that program, which is one of the oldest and kind of most celebrated art conservation programs in the country, will be a theme when I introduce the other conservator today. You will also hear from Anna Alba, who is a paintings conservator. And Anna specializes in the 19th century modern and contemporary works. She also obtained her MA and a Certificate of Advanced Study in Art Conservation. And prior to her work here, she previously worked for the Luca Bonetti Corporation, which is an art conservation firm in New York City that specializes in large format canvases and murals. And she also received additional work through a fellowship at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., and internships at the Smithsonian's Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden and the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, Connecticut. Now, the first person you're going to hear from today, so she's last in my order of introductions, but certainly not least, is our own History Center Registrar, Nicole Laletta. And Nicole came to us and started her position at the History Center in 2015. She is responsible for the care of a museum collection of more than 45,000 objects. And she works among many other things in helping to assess the collection for conservation needs and working with our local conservators, such as Anna and Miranda. Nicole came to us in Pittsburgh from the West Coast and she holds a Bachelor of Arts in Art History from Santa Clara University and a master's degree in museum studies from San Francisco State University and previous to her work with Pittsburgh, she was a museum technician with the National Park Service in the Bay Area at the Golden Gate National Recreation Area, which includes some really fascinating sites like the Presidio and a Nike missile site. So she changed from missile sites to industrial sites. And we are incredibly fortunate to have her on our staff. And I am now going to turn off my video and my microphone, and I am going to turn the program over to Nicole. It is all yours, Nicole. Okay, well, thank you for that marvelous introduction, Leslie. Um, I will take control of the screen and I'm going to try to share my screen here. Give me just a moment. Bear with me. Okay, I think that should be good. So you should see my PowerPoint, my first slide, my title page. Okay, so now let's get started. Um, as Leslie int introduced me, my name is Nicole Laletta. I'm the registrar at the Heinz History Center. I am responsible for the care and um, for the care of the museum artifact collection, which amounts to over 45,000 objects, as Leslie said. 
Um, it's a big job, but I'm here to talk about some of our smallest artifacts, our portrait miniatures. So I will start with a general history of miniatures and then talk about the miniatures in our collection. And all the miniatures in this presentation are from our collection. So I'll be explaining them throughout the presentation just to give you a little behind the scenes of the individual objects. Um, this miniature on this slide depicts Elizabeth Kohler and it is by an unidentified artist and painted circa 1900. So miniatures are small painted portraits, usually done in gouache, watercolor, or enamel on a variety of substrates, including vellum, ivory, paper, and copper. These tiny portraits were created to be shared with family and friends and were popular for their portability. They were some of the only private personal images available before the invention of photography. And the miniature on this slide depicts Mr. William Krogan, the father of Mary Shenley. It is a watercolor on paper and was painted circa 1850. In the 16th century, portrait miniatures were first painted to decorate illuminated manuscripts. The artists then began to offer patrons individual miniatures as freestanding framed works of art. These miniatures first appeared in the 1520s at French and English courts, and then they became popular with the European elite. The 18th century is known as the golden age of miniature portrait painting. During this time, the tradition of miniatures came to the American colonies from England. The format remained popular until the development of daguerreotypes and photography in the mid 19th century. Photography provided more affordable and accurate likenesses, leading to a decline in the demand for portrait miniatures. On this slide, the miniature on the right depicts Clorinda Starbuck Boardman. It is by an artist with the last name of Rogers and it's possibly Nathaniel Rogers. We still need to do a little more research on that. The painting is on ivory and it is circa 1830. The miniature on the left is a colorized photographic print of George Westinghouse done by Joseph Gesford circa 1906. Miniatures were popular for their portability and also for the realistic color that they provided. They were commissioned to be given as gifts within a family or given as gifts during courtship or also used as political or diplomatic gifts. They were often commissioned when a family member was going to be absent for a lengthy period of time or during a milestone event, such as a marriage, a relocation or emigration, or to commemorate birth or death, or also by soldiers and sailors who were enlisting or going off to war. The miniature on this slide depicts Edward Wyndham Harrington Shenley, and it was done by H. Agnes Ridley, who was the subject's daughter. She painted this watercolor on paper in 1904, and it is based on a miniature painted by another artist in 1832. The first miniatures in the 16th and 17th centuries were executed in watercolor paint on stretched vellum and mounted on paper cards. In the 18th and 19th centuries, watercolor on ivory became the standard. The shift in materials during this period was the result of ivory becoming more affordable and more accessible. Ivory also offered more luminosity and better depiction of flesh tones, and the process to prepare the surface of ivory to be painted was simpler than that required to prepare vellum. So ivory remained the most common substrate for portrait miniatures until the fields declined towards the end of the 19th century. An alternate style was miniatures painted on enamel in oil with a copper or gold support. This style started in the 16th century in Italy and was used for the next three centuries throughout Europe. This style of portrait was more expensive and required more skill to execute, but created a more durable product. The miniature on this slide depicts Elizabeth Angus Wade also known by her pen name, Bessie Bramble. She was a Pittsburgh teacher, school administrator, and journalist. And this painted porcelain miniature was done circa 1900 by an unidentified artist. The standard format for miniatures was oval or circular in shape, but some were rectangular as well. The format during the 18th century was often more decorative. They were created to fit into lockets or inside watch covers or set in pieces of jewelry so that they could be carried on the person. Miniatures were also designed to be displayed in the home, either framed on the stands, hung on a wall, or set into snuff box covers. And some miniatures from this period even contain a lock of hair sealed in the reverse. We'll see one later in the presentation. On this slide, the miniature on the left depicts Henry Augustus Boardman. The painting is on ivory and was done circa 1830 by an artist with the last name of Rogers, again, possibly Nathaniel Rogers. The miniature on the right depicts Alberta Ridley. It is a watercolor on paper and was done by H. Agnes Ridley. 
in 1908. Early miniature artists had no formal training and were often self-taught. Many were not full-time miniaturists either. Not all miniatures were signed. If work was unsigned or undated, the hairstyle and dress worn by the subject are sometimes helpful clues in establishing a date or attributing an artist. On this slide, the miniature on the left depicts H. H. Agnes Ridley. This watercolor on paper was done in 1907 by Madame Gregorio de Juria. The subject of this portrait is also the artist for three of the miniatures in our collection, including the one on the right, which she painted of her mother, Mary Krogan Shenley in 1908. So this slide shows the 12 miniatures that we have in the History Center's collection. We know the artist for 75% of our miniatures and they range in date from 1792 to 1908. Ebenezer Denny miniature is right here. And it is the oldest example in our collection. It's from 1792. The min miniature to the left is possibly his wife or daughter, and it was painted during the 1790s. The materials of the miniatures vary as well. Five are watercolor on paper, four are watercolor on ivory, one is painted porcelain, one is a colorized photographic print, and one is unidentified materials at this point. Most are mounted in a metal frame with glass glazing. Five of our miniatures are on long-term exhibition in our visible storage gallery in pull-out drawers in the hallway entrance to the exhibit. Shown here are the drawers and a close-up view of those on display. Four of the 12 miniatures are currently in museum storage and three are in the Pittsburgh Portraits exhibition, including the two Denny miniatures and the George Westinghouse portrait. Miniatures, especially those done on ivory, are extremely fragile. Ivory is very thin and can easily warp under the wrong environmental conditions, and the painted surface must be protected from moisture. To protect these objects and the rest of our collection, we store them in, stable, in a stable environment with controlled temperature and relative humidity. We keep our storage and exhibition spaces clean and secure, and we monitor them for pests. Light exposure is also kept at a minimum to protect from light damage. And when in storage, they are housed in acid-free inert materials inside storage cabinets, such as those you see here. So finally, this is the Ebenezer Denny miniature. It appears as it appears now after the work completed during this conservation project. The Denny miniature and the accompanying miniature of his wife, Nancy Wilkins, or possibly his daughter, Nancy Denny, were donated in 1950 by Louise Denny Barnes, who is the great granddaughter of Ebenezer Denny. The miniatures were discovered in the History Center's Dietrich Library and Archives in 2017. Denny was born in Carlisle, Pennsylvania in 1761, and at the age of 13, he became the bearer of dispatches to Fort Pitt and held this role for two years. Denny was a soldier in the American Revolution and was present when the British forces surrendered at Yorktown, an event that he wrote about in his journal. He also served in the Carolinas under General Arthur St. Clair, and in the Northwest Indian War under General Josiah Harmer and General Sinclair. He continued to keep journals during this period as well. Denny retired from the military in 1794 and returned to Western Pennsylvania. In 1793, he married Nancy Wilkins and they had four children together over the next 10 years, three sons and one daughter. During this period, Denny worked as a merchant. And then in 1797, he was elected County Commissioner. In 1803 and 1808, he served as County Treasurer and when the city of Pittsburgh was incorporated in 1816, Denny was chosen as the first mayor of the city. And he served from July 1816 to January 1817. Unfortunately, ill health forced him to retire from public service at that point. These images show the combination miniature brooch that was donated at the same time as the Denny miniature. The subject was not identified by the donor, but our staff believes it's either Denny's wife, Nancy Wilkins, or his daughter, Nancy Denny. The reverse of the artifact contains a lock of the subject's hair and what appear to be the subject's initials in gold. The initials appear to be NW, so that would indicate that the subject is Nancy Wilson, not Nancy Wilkins, but we don't know for sure. After serving as mayor, Denny returned to his business pursuits, and then Denny dies in 1822, just five years after resigning from public service. He's buried in Allegheny Cemetery in Lawrenceville. And included on this slide is the listing for the Denny O'Hara family papers that are in the History Center's archive. And on the right is the title page for his published journals, which are available through various sources online. 
James Peel painted the miniature of Ebenezer Denny. Peel was born in 1749 in Chestertown, Maryland. He was the younger brother of painter Charles Wilson Peel, and James worked as his brother's assistant. Peel served in the American Revolution and then settled in Philadelphia. By the middle of the 1780s, he had established himself as an accomplished painter of miniature portraits, a field that his brother agreed to give to him during their careers. Most of his miniatures were watercolor on ivory, like the Denny miniature, and around 1810, Peel's eyesight weakened and he moved away from miniatures and began specializing in larger portraits, still lifes, and landscapes. He dies in Philadelphia in 1830. And James Peel is now recognized as one of the most skilled miniature painters of his era, so we're very lucky to have one in our collection. The Denny miniature was cataloged in 2019 in preparation for its inclusion in the Pittsburgh Portraits Exhibition. The miniature is watercolor painted on a thin oval ivory disc with a rose gold plated backing mount. It is very small, just two and a quarter inches tall, just over one and a half inches wide and just over an eighth of an inch deep. And that's including the replacement glass covering. At the point of cataloging, the artist and the subject were both identified, but we did not know the date and could only estimate it based upon the subject's age and the appearance and style of the miniature. The artifact was received with the painted ivory miniature separated from its metal mount, as you see in this photo. The miniature was also missing its original glass lens. Both the painting and the mount had conservation issues that required the specialized attention of conservators and specialists in the field of portrait miniatures. At this point, I contacted paintings conservator Anna Alba and objects conservator Rhonda Wozniak to assess the miniature's condition and see how we could further preserve this artifact. And this slide provides the sources I referenced for this presentation. Um, near the bottom is the link for the History Center's online collection portal. This site allows you to browse a portion of our museum collection and all the miniatures in this presentation are on the site. And more artifacts are added each day, so check it out. Um, my contact information is also at the bottom there. And um, at this point, I will send it over to Anna and Rhonda to talk about their conservation work on the miniature. And I'll stop sharing my screen and send it over. And I'm sorry if I had my image over my presentation for part of it. Anna and Rhonda. We're here. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Um, first, I wanted to thank uh, Leslie, Mary Ruth, Nicole, and the Heinz History Center for hosting this event and for inviting Rhonda and I to speak. Um, I also wanted to thank Carol Aiken, who is actually a specialist in the conservation of portrait miniatures, miniatures located in Baltimore, who consulted on this project and kind of lent us some advice on our, our uh, planned treatment. Um, programs like this offer a very unique opportunity for um, the public to get a a behind the scenes look at what kind of work goes into preparing objects for an exhibition and who are the people that do it. And Rhonda and I are very happy to be here and kind of add our voices to the mix on, um, on Ask a Conservator Day. Um, so I'm gonna actually pass it back over to Rhonda who is going to talk uh, first about the conservation of the case and metal. So. Okay, and I'm going to ask you to start the slideshow then. So when Nicole initially called me in to examine the miniature, this is what I saw. A gilt metal case with a delicate portrait painted on a thin ivory disc. The material around the perimeter of the disc would later be identified as gold beater skin. So here you see the portrait in the metal case on the left and then on the right removed from the case. So even though as an objects conservator, I had treated a, a number of ivory objects, I knew immediately that it would need the expertise of a paintings conservator because this was a very different and very special piece, a delicate watercolor portrait on ivory. But before delving into details here about the treatment, I'd like to mention that there are a multitude of disciplines within conservation. 
some of the broader being objects, paintings, paper, and textiles. And each of these requires specialized conservation training in their respective areas. So I'll talk about this a little bit more at the end, but as Leslie mentioned, Anna and I are part of a multidisciplinary group of conservators in Pittsburgh, which is a great resource for partnerships on projects such as the Den Miniature. We would call this a composite object, meaning that it's composed of a number of different materials. And each material here presented different issues that required a variety of skills in order to treat the miniature properly. So some of the conservation issues that we faced were the, with the miniature were the losses in the painted surface. And this was my main concern when I first saw it, that the paint, and you can see at the bottom right in the blue jacket, where there is some missing. So that I was afraid that it would experience even further loss of paint. And of course, you know, with a, something this small, a miniature, any paint loss would be a, a major loss. And then the, the second issue was corrosion at the metal case. And you can see it here mostly around the rim at the interior. Well, corrosion can be very problematic for metals. If not addressed, it can lead to pitting of the metal, and this could be devastating in a very thin metal such as this. Now, the third issue, and I think Nicole brought this up, you might not, you, you can't even actually even see here, but that was the missing glass cover. And the glass would have protected not only the delicate painting, but the very thin ivory substrate. And ivory is very susceptible to damage for a number of reasons. Um, first, it can be affected by changes in relative humidity. And these, this can result in cracks that you might have seen before on ivory objects. Then there is the like, uh, gross mechanical damage, which could cause just breakage. And I think Anna has an example of that that she's going to show you later. But before this, I'll go over my part of the treatment, which was merely the metal case. So slide two, please, Anna. So here you see where, here, this is a detail image where you see the green copper corrosion products that had formed around the interior of the case. Before removing these, I first confirmed that there were no coatings on the case with the conductivity meter. Then I address the reduction of the corrosion products. Now, due to the fact that the metal is gilded, I knew that I had to use the least aggressive means possible if I wanted to prevent any further loss of the gold. So only solvent was used on soft cotton swabs. And I know this is not anything groundbreaking or even maybe even that interesting, but at times, knowing what not to do as a conservator can be as important as knowing what to do to preserve the art. So in this case, not much else was done. Only a soft microfiber cloth was used to buff the surfaces after solvent cleaning. And we can see the after pictures in slide three. This is the case after treatment. The back of the case on the right shows mostly the copper base metal. And this is probably due to previous polishing and normal wear of the gilt surface over its very, very long lifetime. And now Anna will discuss her treatment of the painting, which is much more interesting. And after this, we'll go back to Nicole and she'll address replacement of the glass lens, which involved even more conservators. So Anna, if you wanna take it from here. Thank you, Rhonda. Just so this is the image that Rhonda was referring to when she brought up the potential for um, the ivory cracking. Ivory disc, the ivory disc is incredibly thin and um, they actually became thinner throughout the, or through their use of the 18th century. Um, but this is just an example of a similar miniature, but that has cracked in seven pieces and fortunately this didn't happen to the one that we're treating, but um, it can happen and it can be quite disastrous. But this was treated quite successfully, as you can see in the, in the third section of the image. This is the face and reverse of the miniature before treatment. 
Um, I'm just going to point out some of the major issues. Um, if you can see my laser pointer, I'm pointing at corrosion deposits around the edge of the surface, and they appear greenish and dark compared to the light colored background. These are the losses that Rhonda was referring to. There's um, losses mainly in the bottom edge where water collected between the original lens and the bottom of the portrait miniature. And luckily much more than this wasn't lost and it appears to affected really only the blue color and the two bottom buttons. Um, on the right hand side, you can see the back of the ivory disc with the gold beater skin wrapped around the reverse and the remnants of what would have been a paper backing. Um, Paper backings were common from 1740 onward when um, ivory discs became thinner and thinner. Artists often backed them with um, a paperboard support, perhaps to reduce the likelihood of warpage. Uh, but there were also, could have been inscriptions or an additional signature on the back, we just won't know um, because this was unfortunately lost. And this is a detail of the bottom third of the portrait. You can see close up the, the losses and the green corrosion along the bottom of the portrait, in addition to discoloration of the ivory um, along the edge. So we decided to remove the remnants of the paper backing, mainly because um, when we wanted to remount it, we wanted to make sure that the reverse was as smooth as possible to kind of prevent differential pressures on the very thin disc. So when it's sandwiched again, we didn't want there to be any um, bulges beneath the ivory that might cause um, pressure unequally or even differences in the expansion of contraction of the ivory, which can also um, cause cracking. So uh, the backing was removed very carefully using a scalpel and um, it needed to be handled with exceptional care because of the thinness of the ivory. And then the, treat the treatment of the front could continue. Um, luckily, the surface wasn't very dirty, so it was merely dusted with a very, very soft brush. But the most difficult portion of the project was um, in painting, which was painstakingly done under magnification and with probably the finest brush available um, and brushes. Your brush choice is actually more important in this in projects like this and in other projects because any stray hair that comes off of a used brush could potentially ruin your in painting and it had to be done so precisely that I wanted to make sure I had the best brush possible um, and best setup. So uh, magnification was very useful. Um, in painting is also challenging because you want to match not only the exact color, but you want to match the, uh, the sheen and the saturation of the original. And in this case, watercolor is very uh, matte medium, but it's also um, very saturated. So it's, it's got a nice high chroma in the jacket. Um, and to match that, you have to also choose your materials very carefully because you can't choose anything that can't be removed later in a potential uh, conservation intervention that might have to occur at a later date. So uh, as conservators, we, we actually follow a code of ethics that's laid out by the American Institute of Conservation where um, when we retouch something, it should be redone in a reversible manner so that things can maybe be retreated. With watercolor, this is challenging because water is so soluble. So the in-painting was primarily done in dry pigments. Dry pigments alone are much too matte and undersaturated. So I had needed to use just the slightest little bit of a synthetic resin to give it the saturation that was required um, to match that blue. Um, I will stop sharing my screen in a second because I have a prop that I brought from my studio. Because I'm not in my studio, I can't show you our 
fantastic collection of uh, dry pigments, but this paint out shows just five, um, five examples of blue, co blue colors or blue pigments that are available. And there are much more. And I get questions pretty commonly about in painting and what colors to choose. Um, blue is pretty challenging, so you have to rely on your, um, your skill as a conservator, and um, you also have to have a working knowledge of the kinds of blues that existed at the time period you're, you're trying to reproduce. So, for instance, both cobalt and cerulean are right off the back, but they're just eliminated because they date much later than the, than the miniature that um, then the, the miniature was produced. So here is the before treatment and the after treatment. Uh, just a note about documentation. Um, as conservators, we are also um, we're also supposed to document all states of the condition before, during, and after treatment. Um, it's also part of our code of ethics. So before any treatment begins, we take very good detailed images as just a record of what was um, there before. And in this case, it's important because we wanted to maintain the appearance and the knowledge of this gold beater's skin around the edge. Um, this material became dark and discolored over time and with the um, corrosion products made it very, um, distracting to the eye if it were to remain visible. So we made the decision to tone it so it wasn't completely gone, um, but it wouldn't be distracting should it go on exhibition. And um, so it was pared down slightly to get rid of corrosion products and then just toned with dry pigments that can be easily removed should um, a future curator or conservator change their minds about what is appropriate for this piece. So we wanted to think about conservation of, of how it, how conservation affects its appearance now and how conservation might affect its appearance later and the decision-making process of, of that. And this is the reverse. So um, not much was done to the gold beater skin on the outside. So it's also retained as, um, as a material for people to study. Um, and this shows the backing that was removed. And here is the before and after image of the portrait um, after treatment and after the lens was added. So I'm going to actually swing the program back over to Nicole who has a few words about the acquisition of the glass lens. All right, I'm back. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. Um, yeah, so after consulting with Anna and Rhonda and them consulting with their network of conservators as well, we decided to um, obtain a replacement glass lens so that the miniature could be remounted safely within its original frame. Um, we were on the fence about whether we should replace the glass, but after, after talking with other conservators, we, de we decided it was essential for the protection of the piece. Um, miniatures of this period, which is 18th century again, were usually outfitted with a shallow convex glass covering and reframing the miniature in this way would contribute to its long-term preservation by protecting the wafer-thin ivory disc from warping and shielding the painted surface from damage and from moisture which had damaged it so much prior to this. Um, so at the recommendation of conservator Carol Aiken, we contacted Weibold Studio to perform the glass fabrication and reframing. Um, they are located in Terrace Park, Ohio, just outside Cincinnati, and they've specialized in portrait miniatures for over 50 years. And they're one of the few studios in the country that do this type of work, so we were very happy to find them. Um, you can flip to the next slide, Anna, and show the profile view. Shows, it's able to show the the beveled edge of the glass and how thin it actually is. Um, so Weibold Studio created a custom convex glass lens to fit exactly inside our miniatures frame. The glass is held in place by the edge of the frame, which is then burnished to secure the lens in place. So there's no adhesive used 
in the remounting process. The case holds the glass in place and then that holds the miniature snug in its mount. So with the glass replacement that completed the conservation work, um, the miniature was safely remounted inside its frame with the new glass protecting it and it was ready for its debut in the Portraits of Pittsburgh exhibition. So that's the end of the conservation section. And Leslie and Anna and Rhonda can come back and we can kind of chat about other questions. And so Anna and Rhonda, do you have more, I know one of the things we wanted to give you a chance to do was talk a little bit more about some of the other really fascinating conservation projects that you've worked on here in the Pittsburgh area or anywhere else. I do have a few questions already about the conservation of the miniature and one that I'll ask you all now because it's relevant to what we just talked about. How long You've all talked about your specific pieces in this. How long did the whole treatment of the miniature take from start to finish? I think that I, for the metal specifically, it was only really two to three hours, but it was a lot of discussions and figuring out what to do, having, going through Anna, contacting Carol, and then the Weibold Studios, and then, trying to piece it all together in the end, literally. So a, a little bit more than that, but Anna can talk about more about how long the painting took because that was actually the more painstaking part of it, I think. Yeah, it's it's hard to, to really add it up because when you're physically working on something, you your day is kind of punctuated by documenting and then setting up the camera or the lights or getting the, the lighting just right for in painting and setting up for your in painting. So once I sat down to in paint, I didn't want to waste a whole lot of time getting up and getting materials. So I had kind of a whole slew of choices. You couldn't see it in the images, but um, I had a whole um, arsenal of materials that I had kind of at the ready. So there's a lot of setup and breakdown and changing your, um, you know, your mode and uh, your frame of mind to, to work on a painting, but like sitting down and working on it, I think probably a few hours to get the blues right. Um, I did test them a little bit first and on a separate card and hold it up just because I didn't want to um, do tests on the, on the physical surface. So yeah, it's, it's hard to say. <laughs> I think, that people, I think people might be surprised at actually how long it takes. Like they might see that there's this little tiny loss of paint and they think, oh, they just went doo -doo, and it's done. But there's so much more involved in that. It takes so much patience and so much time that you, 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 you can't really account for. And to, to talk about the bigger picture, I, I think I cataloged it in May of 2019 when it was being, it was slated for exhibition. So I had to get it cataloged. And then I contacted the conservators and we had to schedule when you could come in and look at it. And I brought in Rhonda to start and then she suggested bringing in Anna and then we talked to other conservators. And then it went out for treatment, I think in September, 2019 to both of you. And it came back to me in between because I, my, I take photographs as well before and after each conservator takes it. So that's an extra step of documentation. Um, and then it, it was finished, I think maybe in November, October, probably 2019. And then Weibold Studio didn't take it until February of 2020. And it came back in March. So it was really almost a year of work for the entire project, not, not just the conservation portion of it. Mm -hmm. And another question that is in the chat that it probably would be a good idea to answer now. You've talked about the in painting deciding what to remove or how to leave a piece there and just sort of overpaint it. Who makes those decisions? Do you as the conservators, Rhonda and Anna, do you just decide to do that? How do you coordinate that with kind of getting approval from Nicole and the museum? Can you talk a little bit about how that process works between the three of you? That's exactly what we have to do. We have to get approval. I mean, we might make recommendations on what we think would be best for the piece historically what we would we will, what we would suggest 
um, retaining, but then in the end, ultimately, it's the client's decision on whether or not they want to do that. Um, if Anna hadn't impainted the gold beater skin, for instance, maybe they, the Nicole would have decided that that was too distracting. So there, there are a lot of different scenarios that we have to talk through. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of back and forth through the entire project and the conservators prepare a proposal for us at the beginning outlining what they recommend doing and then we approve it and they go forward with it but sometimes in the middle of the project it'll change or we have to go back and forth about something that was unexpected um, and I credit both Anna and Rhonda for encouraging us to get the glass lens replaced as well because um, we weren't necessarily going to take it that far because that's more of a restoration treatment um, but yeah, it's a lot of back and forth throughout the whole thing. And I mean, budgetary constraints can affect it as well, depending on how much it costs to get the work done, how much time we have to get it done. All of that comes into, into play. Oh, and here is another question. And since Anna, you had talked about showing your pigment chart and the idea that, for example, cobalt or cerulean couldn't be used as part of this. Um, Melissa says that the history of pigments is so fascinating. What other colors would have been common during the heyday of miniatures like this? Oh man. <laughs> what other, I mean, some, what might some of the other most lot. typical colors be? <laughs> um, as a modern and contemporary person, I'm gonna say that I'm more familiar with actually modern uh, materials, but um, ultramarine was used at this time and it has been used for a really long time any of the earth tones um, had always been used. So through, you know, through, through antiquity, really, um, a lot of reds, reds and yellows would have been um, readily available. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, the dates for the different green colors, but um, yeah, I mean, the history of pigments is really fascinating and it, it goes into um, what was available through trade and through different countries and certain pigments were readily available in certain areas but not in others and made them more valu valuable or less valuable. Um, so I don't know if I answered your question because it's so very specific but um, I, I think a fun part of our training too at Buffalo was we actually had to pick a pigment and make it traditionally how it was made. You, you did that right Anna? Mm -hmm. We went through the same program so and I will say that I had did, done a little bit of study of pigments through a course at University of Delaware and the history of those materials and even some incredibly poisonous pigments that people use at times. It really is fascinating. So I don't have any other of the questions there at the moment. For, for all three of you, you know, I think maybe it might surprise people to know that it took so many different hands to handle this one small piece. Can you go into a little bit more detail about why, for example, we couldn't just have Anna work on this miniature, or Rhonda? Why do you have, need so many different kinds of conservators? Talk a little bit more about the reality of the materials and that sort of scientific aspect of this. Why can't a um, paintings conservator work on the metal? Well, um, <laughs> It starts back in our back in our training, but uh, we choose a specialty to pursue when we're in graduate school, and there is a good deal of overlap. So we do, we all take courses in the other disciplines, but there's so much material in any one discipline. It's hard to know um, about everything. Is basically why we we choose to follow certain disciplines. Um, but in ma materials like this, I perhaps wouldn't know that much about the corrosion of the backing and how it might interact with the ivory. And I know some about ivory, but I don't really know how it is in composite with the other materials. And so it's always good to have that um, another point of view to come in and can speak to their specialty. And maybe we could introduce the the ACE little um, ACE PowerPoint right now because I think that I talk a little bit about that about our different areas of specialization and how we work together or how we have worked together on other projects around Pittsburgh too. Okay. Yes. Why don't you go ahead and go ahead and do that? And also, 
I think the other thing that it might be useful to talk just a little bit about, because I know we get this question on the museum end, as part of your review of some of this, what is the difference between conserving something and restoring something? Talk a little bit about that too. Well, in conserving, you're, it's basically, it's literally a more conservative approach. So you're trying to preserve what remains and not necessarily restore what is not there anymore. As, as Nicole mentioned, she didn't know if they were going to go as far as restoring the glass lens. So that was completely replaced. So in conservation, we try to keep it, the restoration to a minimum and really focus on preserving what is there now. And I, th I think that's, that's, that, that basically covers it. Um, although there's always an overlap, for instance, when Anna impainted the losses in the miniature, that might be considered more of a restoration because she put that paint back. So there's always a little bit of an overlap, keeping in mind that we try to be as conservative, preserving what is there more than restoring what isn't. And I've had a question come in as part of that. Did you both, did you have to study chemistry or what science in order to understand materials and their reactions? Yeah, I, I think people would be surprised at how much chemistry we actually have to, to study before we, before we even get into a conservation program. So one of the prerequisites of the conservation graduate programs in the United States is um, at least four semesters of science and then we take science courses within our graduate studies, specifically um, covering the degradation of products and um, like solubility of materials and how things interact. So there, it's um, it's it's paramount to to everything we do. It's basically we, science is acting as the backbone. So basically, it's you, you know what, to, what you can use on a piece of art so that it will be reversible, as Anna mentioned before. So if you don't understand solubility parameters, you may not use the, the correct material, and it won't be able to be reversed in the future. Here's another question related to that, and then we'll get into your, the discussion of art conservation, etc. cetera. I've got a question come in from an attendee who wonders if you've ever heard of anyone doing chemical or DNA analysis on the hair that can be included. I know we saw the example of Nancy Wilkins on the back of a portrait miniature. Have you ever heard of chemical or DNA analysis being done on that as part of the exploration of a piece? I haven't heard of it personally, but I imagine that it can be done. But normally if a lock of hair is included with that portrait, it's from that person. So I don't know if there would be a point in doing that, going through that expense, but it would be interesting. Yeah, we've done it um, for the History Center collection, not from a miniature lock of hair, uh, lock of hair in a miniature, but a lock of hair um, commemorative. We have one that's commemorative of George Washington's hair and we had it tested and I believe it was inconclusive because it was it was a lock of hair with no root balls on it. So they were able to tell the, the actual color of the hair and I think estimate the age possibly, but not, not identify it as George Washington since there wasn't, there was no DNA since there was no root bulb. So it was inconclusive, but there people do do that testing definitely. Okay, so Anna and Rhonda, if you want to go ahead and, and talk a little bit more about art conservation, et cetera, go ahead. Okay, so as um, Leslie mentioned at the beginning, Anne and I belong to a collaborative group of conservators here in Pittsburgh, and we call this Art Conservation, etc., or ACE Conservators for short. So we're all academically trained. We have our master's in conservation, and after receiving our degrees, we all worked in various parts of the world gaining that conservation experience, which is really important to get out there and have that experience behind you or under your belt. And this involved positions in major museums. We're also all very proud of the fact that we are natives to the Pittsburgh area and we all operate our own women owned businesses. So if you wanna to go to slide two, I mean, I'll like to introduce you to everyone. First, well, you know, Anna, and if you press the next button, it'll come down with your picture, yep. Oh. 
<laughs> and <laughs> Anna briefly mentioned, and Anna with Anna Alba Art, Anna, I mean Alba Art Conservation, and Anna specializes in paintings, of course, but she has a further em emphasis in treating modern paintings, and she mentioned this. And the next is Ricka Folk of Folk Fine Art Conservation. She's also a paintings conservator. And Ricka has um, a special interest in old master paintings. And next is Jessica Keister of Still City Conservation. She's a paintings conservator with literally a focus on photographs. And next we have Patty Huss West, an objects conservator like myself. And Patty works a lot with gilded objects. And then there's me object and objects conservator and I have a specialization in metals and like Leslie said each of these areas of specialization can go deeper and deeper for instance in my earlier days I specialized in marine archaeological objects or objects from shipwrecks so that just gives you an idea of how esoteric it can get. So the next slide will show you a few examples of projects that we worked on together um, we, because we, we pull all of our skill sets to work together on projects like the, the Denny miniature. And these are a few other examples. Um, since we're all natives of Pittsburgh, we really do take great pride in preserving Pittsburgh treasures. And you might recognize the one on the top left. This is the tribute to children or also known more commonly as the Mr. Rogers sculpture on the North Shore. And what we do here is more of a preventative treatment. And we've been doing this for the past six years. I think one year was off because there was construction at the site. But for the past six years, we've been washing and waxing and buffing him to prevent corrosion from forming on the surface. You might know um, the green patina that forms on typically on outdoor bronze sculptures. So this is what we do to prevent that from happening. And then below is, I believe, Ricka in her hazmat suit when she and Anna worked to save the portrait paintings that were discovered during the renovations at the old Carnegie Library on the north side. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that, Anna? Um, sure. Yeah, they were uncovered during the construction and there were only um, like three portraits left of the whole niche series. And we went in, we had three days to remove them before the construction kind of took over the site again. And they were held into the niches with, um, with actually a lead-based adhesive. So we had to completely put on uh, protective gear and equipment and be absolutely careful with the handling of these paintings. Um, and treatment hasn't commenced on these, but they, they have been saved for future treatment. And that's what was important at this time. Okay, and then the, the last um, image on the right, <laughs> the largest image, is a project that most of us have worked on intermittently for the past about nine years, <laughs> and I can't believe it's been that long, but these are the amazing murals of Max Ivanka at St. Nicholas Croatian Catholic Church in Millville, and here you see us up on a hydraulic lift at about 38 feet, and this was this past month to complete a survey of the um, upper murals. So if you're not familiar with these murals, you really should go to, and I'm going to plug it here, vongamurals.org to find out more about them. They are truly incredible. The artist was given free reign to paint whatever he wanted. So beyond the typical religious iconography, you have his protest to war and the exploitation of the immigrant worker and these social injustice issues that unfortunately still remain very relevant today. And coincidentally, tomorrow is the Society to Preserve the Millville Murals of Max Ivanka's fundraising event, Cocktails and Conservation. So you'll also find information about the event, which is totally virtual this year, of course, but still promises to be a great event. But if you go to vankamurals.org, you can find out more about that. So we'll go back to, unless anyone has any questions about any of these projects, we can go back to Leslie, maybe. Does anyone have any final questions about the conservation projects? 
So it's two o'clock. Our goal for this program was roughly to get it in there within about an hour. And you remember at the beginning, I said there was a final sort of piece of this related to that date of November 4th. And of course, everybody knows Ebenezer Denny now in connection with the fact that he is, of course, the first mayor of Pittsburgh. But the other piece is this, that the identity of James Peel as the portraitist in 1792 puts Denny in Philadelphia at a very narrow window. He's there from the end of December, roughly between December 19th and December 23rd, 1791, until May 1st, 1792, where in his journal he writes, I've resigned my commission and I'm headed to Pittsburgh. Why was he in Philadelphia? He was in Philadelphia because he had been sent there from the Northwest Indian frontier, what we would consider Ohio, after the disastrous defeat of General Arthur St. Clair's forces, where a confederation of Native American groups, including Delaware, Potawatomi, basically overwhelmed what was out there of General Arthur St. Clair's forces. And it became one of the worst defeats for the Americans in military history. It was kind of a high watermark in one sense for the Native American groups who were out there. That defeat happened 229 years ago today on November 4th, 1791, setting the stage to send Ebenezer Denny as one of the lucky people who got to go to Philadelphia and report on this to George Washington. So it's this wonderful little tie in at the end of here is this piece that we conserved as part of the exhibit in preparation for the Smithsonian's Portraits of Pittsburgh. It relates to another piece that is on display in that exhibition, the portrait of Arthur St. Clair, and it's a wonderful tie-in. And I'll just add at the end, if you are interested in learning more about General Arthur St. Clair, we have another program coming up next Tuesday, November 10th, part of our Uncovering Pittsburgh Stories series with the Heinz History Center docents. We have a presentation on General Arthur St. Clair that will be at one o'clock on the History Center YouTube channel. And likewise, a recording of this program will also be presented on that YouTube channel. It takes us a little bit of time to get them ready to post, but feel free to check out both a recording of this event and the Arthur St. Clair event. And there are a number of other great recordings on there as well. So we are so appreciative, Nicole, Rhonda, Anna, thank you so much for being here today. This is just between the pigment colors and the science and the wonders of what we have behind the scenes. It's fascinating stuff and we really do hope to do more programs that feature the collection and allow people to get this sort of unseen view of what goes on in the museum in the future. So thank you to all three of you. And then thank you as well to all of you out there in Zoom viewer land who joined us today. We greatly appreciate the support. So have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, too. Thank you. Thank you.